already. The Institute for Philosophy and Religion was founded a half century ago by a group of philosophers, theologians, and scholars of religion at Boston University, among whom were teachers of Martin Luther King Jr. when he was doing his PhD here in the School of Theology in Systematic Theology. This group of scholars came together to found the Institute because they wanted to create and preserve a space within the university for people to ask the kinds of questions that lead one to things like philosophy, religion, and theology in the first place. To ask those kinds of basic existential human questions, including the question of God, whether there is one, what difference it makes, within a university that was increasingly seeing higher degrees of specialization that tended to leave those kinds of questions behind, and as they, as they saw it, higher degrees of fragmentation, such that the departments that they were part of weren't really even talking to one another anymore. To this day, and for the 50 years since, the Institute has tried to cultivate those kinds of questions. And the question at the heart of this year's lecture series is that of the end of the university, where that title picks out multiple distinct senses of end. The end of the university in the sense of the telos or aim or purpose of the university, but also the end of the university in the sense of the sustainability and future of this institution in our current moment. Now, as I was trying to promote this lecture in this lecture series recently, someone commented, a, a, a faculty member from elsewhere, about the title. They said, well, they sure are performing the crisis narrative, aren't they? And it made me step back to think about what it is that we're about. Our lecturer today, whom I'm gonna introduce in a moment, will we'll bring to the fore continuities and discontinuities between the past and past discourses about crisis and the present. But it can't be the case that we shut down the possibility of concern or shut down the possibility of question because some discourse is, is familiar or even ubiquitous. And so the venture and the gambit of this lecture series is that there's something here worth talking about between the relationship of what a university is or ought to be for and what kind of future it may or may not have. So with that, I, I can hardly think of a, a better person to weigh in on this topic than our distinguished lecturer. Dr. Chad Wellman is professor of German studies at the University of Virginia, where he also holds appointments in history and media studies. He received his PhD at UC Berkeley and completed his undergraduate studies at Davidson College. His scholarly work ranges across the history of knowledge and information, the history of technology and universities, and social theory. In addition to editing volumes on Nietzsche, on Max Weber and on the rise of the research university. He's the author of numerous books, including Becoming Human, Romantic Anthropo Anthro Anthropology and the Embodiment of Freedom, published by Penn State Press, Organizing Enlightenment, Information Overload and the Invention of the Modern Research University, published by Johns Hopkins Press, and most recently with Paul Ryder, Permanent Crisis, The Humanities in a Disenchanted Age, published by University of Chicago Press. As a cultural commentator, especially focusing on the shape, character, and meaning of the university and its intersection with questions of values, Dr. Wellman is also an accomplished essayist, and his work has appeared in venues such as the Hedgehog Review, the Times Literary Supplement, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. Alongside these scholarly endeavors. Dr. Wellman was, until just last year, principal of Brown College, UVA's distinctive residential living learning community, and something that will be of special interest to the Killachan honor students who are here today. 
He also helped oversee the creation of UVA's new core curriculum. And I'm supposed to tell a joke here about the BU Hub, but I think mentioning it suffices. Alongside these scholarly endeavors, uh, or in relationship to our topic, it is indeed hard to imagine a more perceptive observer than Dr. Wellman, who brings a rare depth of knowledge about the distinctive conditions under which the modern research university came to be and the consequences of that inception. Knowledge that sheds light on questions at the heart of our series. One task of the historian is to call us away from illusions about our own time by helping us more clearly to see how our moment does and does not stand in continuity with what has gone before. By seeing more truthfully what is and is not distinctive about our time, we can get a better understanding of what has come before. And our idea, our idea of what is possible can be expanded according, accordingly. We don't have to order off this menu. We can go to another restaurant altogether, as it were. But the historian can also help us confront the likelihood that some of our ideas about what's possible are best understood as wish, wishful thinking or even delusions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wellman as he lectures on deflection, value capture, and the permanent crisis of the humanities. Uh, David, thanks so much um, for that introduction. Thanks for the invitation to come. I thank you ahead of time because uh, you might not be so grateful. Um, at the end, David said this would be a great opportunity to test out new ideas. So I'll mention this book. Uh, the cover, at least, I think is, 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 is cool. Uh, what's in between, I'll leave it to you to judge. Um, but I, I really do. I want to take me to task. Um, because this is, uh, David said, he didn't say it's a safe uh, venue, but he said it'll be a, a fruitful venue uh, for failed attempts. Um, so deflection, value capture, and the permanent crisis of the humanities. How we talk about the humanities. When a faculty member, a dean, or an op-ed writer talks about the humanities, idle chatter tends to pull even the most persistent of us, pushing us to talk about but preventing us from ever getting at a real concern. Humanities chatter delivers us over to an already determined way of talking about that which we care. Is this, uh... Humanities chatter, we could say, takes two primary forms. First, an appeal to data. Data, of course, is the plural of datum, the neuter past participle of dare, meaning that which is given or take it for granted in an argument. It could be propositions or values, such as a mathematical problem in which the value of x is simply given as 3, x equals 3. Data can then be collected, organized, and visualized in tables or spreadsheets, algebraic problems or line graphs, and then made the basis of a rhetorical argument. Consider, for example, this graph. You've probably seen some of these. Line graphs like these provide the values for how we talk about the humanities. The number of BAs awarded annually by colleges and universities in the United States in English literature and philosophy, according to the PEDS data. So enrollments, the number of PhDs awarded. You'll notice the slope of these graphs. So if these BAs and enrollments are the values that are given as data, that which we take for granted, what then are the values that, again, like a math problem, are sought? That is, what's to be valued on the basis of these given values? Assuming that is, or will you grant me the premise, that BAs are not the only values, are not the only values that we have to take for granted. So, humanities chatter as an appeal to data. The second is an appeal to anecdote. And this consists of individual testimonies to quickly and inartfully perhaps put to argumentative purposes. It puts confession to work as public hortatory address. So it uses personal anecdote as prima facie evidence to justify not only one's own experiences of reading and of writing and thinking, but also the social value of literature, of philosophy, of liberal education, the humanities, and the university. These things ought to matter to everyone 
to our public, to taxpayers, to governments, to institutions, because they mattered to me. In either form, humanities chatter induces readers and listeners into a set of values purported to be t unique to the humanities, so qualitative over quantitative reasoning, a celebration of interpretation and awareness of positivism, an interest in and concern with the subject of knowledge, not merely the object of knowledge, valuation of the particular as much as the universal. Humanities chatter pits ways of knowing against one another and reduces them to institutional function, functions, the humanities versus the sciences, STEM versus the humanities, the humanities versus the world. The rhetorical force of humanities chatter derives from the clarity of these abstractions, the ease of the substitutions for the difficulty of getting at what we love and actually care about, what we desire to know. So in, our most recent, in my most recent book with Paul Ryder, I consider the conceptual, ethical, and institutional conditions under which and within which this humanities chatter developed, and more broadly, the contradictory legacies of humanist knowledge practices. And we called this the permanent crisis of the humanities. We had two primary objects of critique. A, how the notion of a crisis of the humanities has been invoked, and B, how it, that notion of crisis has been dismissed. Since at least the 19th century, humanities scholars have felt threatened by the very processes that supplied the means for the modern humanities literature departments, philosophy departments, to flourish. So this is institutional rationalization, bureaucracy, the democratization of knowledge, secularization, colonialism, and quite simply capitalism. These same conditions that made the modern humanities possible, that allowed somebody like me to have a parking spot in health insurance because I teach the humanities, also imperiled the humanities. Rationalization and modernization enabled and disabled. Specialization was fruitful and innovating. The demand to produce knowledge transformed, but it also deformed. The humanities came into their own, we argued, in late 19th century, Germ in 19th, late 19th century Germany by being framed as, in effect, a privileged institutional resource for resolving all of these crises of meaning and value that threatened other cultural or social goods as well. That's to say, part of the story of why the modern humanities are always in crisis is that we have needed them to be in crisis. To paraphrase, to paraphrase Freud, we might say, the norms and the rules and the institutions that we create to manage our lives also make us miserable. And yet, after I finished Permanent Crisis last fall, or it was published last fall, I was pretty hopeful. I won't speak for Paul. Paul, I mean, he's, he's translating the first volume of Marx's Capital, so if you want to think that speaks for himself. Um, so Professor uh, DeCosimo's invitation to speak in a series titled The End of the University, I think is a good occasion for me to consider why. So I wrote this book about permanent crisis, and I was filled with hope. I think my own reasons for hope are bound up with the, the dual meanings of the end of the university in the, the series title. One, I'd say, like all things we create, the university will wilt and fade away, even as we attempt to renew again and again and again. Two, and yet the intellectual desire, the epistemic virtues, and the discipline study that the university has often cultivated alongside myriad other ends and purposes, I'd argue will remain, even if not primarily in the university. These are the reasons to hope that whatever becomes of the university, geistige Arbeit, or as Max Weber's phrase, so intellectual work, remains our vocation. And in my new book, After the University, I'm thinking about the different ends that accompanied the transformation of the modern disciplinary or research university over the course of the 20th century into the system of higher education. And in particular, I want to understand how higher learning came to be experienced, came to be studied, came to be valued, both individually and socially, primarily as an effect or an outcome, to use socio sociologists speak. That is, we've come to value higher learning, the system of education, in terms of questions of access, social mobility, economic growth, efficiency, in terms of who has and who does not have a BA, and the correlation of that with all of the things that sociologists tend to enumerate when they talk about the system of higher education. So it's a distinction that names an output, and that does not necessarily have anything to do with or any interest in the, what I would call the internal goods of higher learning. This is, I'd 
suggest both a diminished and a pernicious. I guess if you're going to call it diminished and pernicious, you don't suggest, right? You just assert. Uh, so this is both a pernicious and diminished view. It mistakes institutional and organizational forms for the epistemic practices, ideals, and values that make these very institutions and organizations worth valuing in the first place. It deflects and redirects the reasons and values we have or had for reading, for thinking, for talking, for being together, and caring about knowledge onto values that are quite different. And ultimately, it conflates internal and external goods. And the way I want to try to think through this, um, both as I want to do historically but also conceptually, is through th two concepts, deflection and value capture. Deflection, according to the philosophers Cora Diamond and Tal Brewer, from whom I adapt the concept, is a propensity, as they understand it, of philosophers to get drawn to a subject by a life problem and then find their attention diverted towards a substitute discussion that allows for greater clarity and that absorbs their attention associated with that original life problem, but that does not actually address that life problem. So to take a random example, Imagine an 18-year-old from Western North Carolina who had a sense that uh, his upbringing in the evangelical Appalachian foothills um, in which good and evil were strictly separated and juxtaposed might be a bit more complex but didn't have any language or concepts through which to think that through. That 18-year-old might enroll in a Nietzsche course titled Beyond Good and Evil and then 20 years later find himself arguing about um, the date of footnotes in Nietzsche's uh, Ausgabe, collected edition. That's deflection, according to Diamond, in a way. Now, Diamond and Brewer discussed deflection as a propensity of philosophers, but I wanted to expand the concept to name a propensity of all scholars, of all students, of all citizens of universities, those formed in the modern university, to come to experience this diffusion and diversion of goals and purposes onto substitute concerns. And I'm saying substitute, I'm not saying necessarily bad, necessarily lesser than, but very different than the values and the goods with which we thought we were beginning. Now over time, the reasons we, why we do something or our understanding of an activity's goods, they can change. We often undertake an activity with only a vague sense of who we might become at the end or why we were undertaking it at all. I wanted to start playing baseball so my grandma would stop bugging me. And that's how I did it. I went to the neighbor the next door and played baseball, and that was an excuse. Turns out, after five years, I actually loved playing baseball. So as I use the term, deflection names not such a developmental process, but rather a diminishment and a distortion of those original reasons. Deflection on my account is closely related to a second concept, which I adapt from the philosopher C.T. Nguyen. So our purposes and reasons for doing something can be not only deflected and diminished, they can also be redirected to a particular or particular pre-established values. Nguyen calls this, if you haven't, has, he, has anybody ever read C.T. Nguyen's stuff? He, he's, he, ostensibly, he's a philosopher of games. He, 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 he uh, is a philosophy professor at Utah. There's this great kind of intro. I'm not in the habit of recommending Ezra Klein podcast, but there's an amazing interview uh, with C.T. Nguyen, who teaches at uh, University of Utah. And he's, his, his first book is brilliant on uh, gaming, like video games, and the questions of agency. He's currently my favorite, favorite philosopher. So I'm kind of thinking all this through him. So our purposes and reasons for doing something can not only be deflected and diminished, they can also be redirected to particular pre-established values. Nguyen calls this phenomenon value capture. We might begin an activity or join an institution with values that are rich, woven, we might think, from the stuff of life, but these values can be captured by values that are clear, more easily communicable and portable across, for example, bureaucratic structures. Or for Nguyen, video games. The coins, the numbers, the ding-ding-dings, the social media, that's one way to think about this. 
Consider, for example, how the value, rightly I'd say, accorded to the sharing of attention, place, and time between a teacher and a student can be captured by questions number six and seven on UVA's Provostial Student Evaluation Scheme. And here I will quote directly from our Student Evaluation Scheme. Question number six, was the instructor available to support my learning? Question number seven, did the instructor, quote, foster an environment where I felt valued as an individual and belonged in the classroom? On a, on a one to five scale, but it doesn't stop there. Each class has a mean, and each class mean is compared then to a departmental mean, and then to a school-wide mean, and then to an inter-school mean at the provostial level. So the problem here, I'd argue, I, like, I love administration and bureaucracy. That is not my primary object of critique. The problem here is not the quantification or that complex bureaucracy, bureaucracies are necessarily bad, or that they corrupt otherwise crystalline values. The problem is that complex bureaucracies like universities, modern universities, can cultivate a particular disposition, particular relationship to numbers in this case. Because numbers travel easily and efficiently from classroom to department and up the administrative hierarchy, for example, they can be used not to help understand relationships between different, different phenomena, what we call quantification, but rather to substitute one value for another because of efficiency and in the name of ease. Numbers are more portable, more easily communicable. So Diamond and Nguyen situate deflection and value capture within philosophy departments. When philosophers are deflate, deflected from a life problem onto a moral issue or a philosophical debate, they are conducting themselves as they had been trained to do, arguing in a particular way and with the persona of a disciplined university philosopher. And that, writes Core Diamond, is, quote, what university part departments are for. Diamond and Nguyen are talking about contemporary institutions. They're not asking if or why university students in 14th century Paris or 19th century Berlin experienced deflection and value capture. But that's exactly the kind of question that interests me. Because my question is something more like this, I think. This is my, my, my testing out uh, process, as it were. Are deflection, value capture, or maybe even value collapse necessary effects or entailments of big, complex institutions like modern research universities, or just modern universities, or the modern or the contemporary system of higher education? Does the need of large-scale institutions to transform human activities into forms that can be measured, that can be recorded and made portable and easily communicable across complex hierarchical structures necessi necessarily diminish the individual and social experience of practicing these activities well. Right? These, are the question, these are questions about the scale of human action. Do some activities require bigger scales, smaller scales? Right? In the case of universities, I'd argue that deflection and value capture only became prominent structural features of university with the rise of research universities in the 19th century. And I think understanding why can help us understand how, where, and with whom we might today cultivate the internal goods and values of disciplined study. So here's my, def my, my detour into the kind of a historical framing of these deflection and value capture. So to understand why deflection and value capture might seem such natural features of the university and of a humanities discipline like philosophy, it's important to recognize the degree to which the continuities between the modern university-based disciplines, collectively known as the humanities today, and earlier forms of humanist knowledge, if you've ever heard of a term like, such as this, such as the studi humanitatis, have been exaggerated. The modern humanities that is, are not the products of an unbroken tradition reaching back to the Renaissance and then ultimately uh, to Greek and Roman antiquity. Arts faculties sustain, so now we have the College of Arts and Sciences, right? These are legacies of a, of a much older institutional feature called arts faculties. And arts faculties sustained a range of intellectual practices from reading and writing to calculation and rhetoric. And beginning in the, especially in the 15th century, they entwine these practices with forms of life well outside the university. In the domestic realm of family and kin, the commercial spaces of markets, and in the judicial and diplomatic spaces of courts. That is what uh, the skills and the practices of reading and writing were very much professionalizing skills that everybody who was in a university was assumed 
to have. In fact, you couldn't go up to one of the higher faculties, law, medicine, or theology, without having put in at least a year or two in, quote, the humanities, but in a very different sense that we talk about humanities today. So after their golden age in the 15th and 16th century, arts faculties in the Studio Humanitatis with them suffered through more than two centuries of decline. By the end of the 18th century, enrollments in these art faculties at most German university or German speaking uh, lands approached zero. That is, um, secondary schools kind of took over this job of training uh, students in read into reading and writing. Around 1800, however, especially in Prussia, apologists for the arts faculty finally began to gain traction with the state. And that's when German speaking intellectuals, scholars, and civil servants sought to transform the Studio Humanitatis and all those arts that were in the arts faculties that had settled into the lower faculty of the university into something more than a prerequisite for study in the higher faculties of law, medicine, and theology. So linking these technical arts and helping sciences, they were often called the Hilfswissenschaften, that is like literally the, the supplementary or helping sciences that everybody had to have to do anything. Linking these technical arts to a human capacity for spontaneous and creative reason, Immanuel Kant, for example, the neo-humanist, idealist, and early romantics of in uh, early, late 18th century, um, early 19th century Germany, elevated these activities and the creations of the human mind, what Kant called the arts and the sciences, above the merely technical, above the merely useful, above the merely necessary. They wanted to turn the arts faculty into a self-sustaining moral and philosophical project not just a supplementary factory, a poipedeutic or preparatory faculty for the professional faculties. They wanted to turn it into what Kant called in 1798, the Department of Truth, i.e. the philosophy faculty. I'm not even lying, he calls it the department. It's the Department of Truth. Stealing a Prussian bureaucratic term, the, the Department of Truth. I, I find that amazing. I don't even think it was a joke. Uh, so, so the philosophy, this philosophical project would be located within the university, and it would be not just a local university institutional project, it would be, as he put it, a species level developmental project. Those were his aims. All this part of a broader political and social reform effort uh, then underway in Prussia. In these debates, the distinction between philosopher, this is the beginning of the 19th century, between philosopher and philologist and bureaucrat was blurred by a common interest in turning this moral and philosophical project into a stable institution with its own norms, its own ideals, and its own values. So philosophers like Fichte and Schleiermacher wrote lectures and letters that mixed philosophical system building with bureaucratic information transfer. They were writing memos about how to form a new university. And bureaucrats like Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was also a classical philologist, wrote memos that mixed descriptions of responsibilities and rules with idealist statements of purpose. They asked the same question. What makes for a good institution? What makes in particular for a good educational institution? And they answered, one that gave objective form to subjective beliefs, expectations, and values. And over the following three decades, the first uh, three or four decades of the 19th century, dec uh, a line of philosophically minded Prussian bureaucrats adapted, adopted, and fitfully tried to make many of these ideals real. In a memorandum addressed to King Wilhelm III, Wilhelm von Humboldt um, wrote that the purpose of the university was twofold, to join objective knowledge with subjective development, to provide an institutional structure that disciplined and oriented intellectual desire to common ends making it sustainable and repeatable, to craft and to articulate a public. The nature of this twofold purpose crystallized into what the Minister of Culture uh, in, called in 1844 the dual vocation of the university, to foster scholarly knowledge and, this is crucial, prepare young men to serve both the state and the church. So the university project became a political, social, constituting project. It was in these intervening decades and under this dual vocation that the disciplines were disciplined, that the rel relative autonomy, academic freedom, of university scholars was secured. Scholars in universities more deliberately incorporated into state bureaucracies. They were civil servants from the beginning. The value of research eclipsed that of teaching. The value of printed publications as markers of prestige was established. A system of adjunct university labor emerged. The first PhDs were awarded. There were no PhDs until the early 19th century. 
that is, doctorate degrees from the arts or the philosophy faculties. It was a very modern invention because you can't give the highest degree to, an insti to a, 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 a faculty that just helps out the other professional faculties. Right? So in a way, this is making philosophy and literature autonomous, granting it its own legitimacy. You had, you had to have jobs, though. So the most important thing that they didn't mention, but the bureaucrats mentioned, there was a direct path to that in teaching in the elite gymnasium, the elite German secondary high schools. They created a market for this autonomous philosophy and literature. And all the other elements, all these things that we take for granted as, oh, that's just a modern research university, right? The protocols of professionalism. Now, Diamond and Nguyen connect deflection and value capture to the university, I think, because they understand the effects of this transformation, at least in part. The identification of philosophy or any discipline study with a complex, bureaucratically organized institution, the university. The university, but the university not as the universitas, that is this local guild-like corporation of students and teachers that kind of we can trace back to 13th century Paris, because right? universitas doesn't mean universal knowledge, it means a corporation, a guild. Right? But the organized, so the university not as, as a guild, the local guild, but the university as the organizing system of modernity and social progress. 19th century Prussians wanted to create not just an in individual institution, they wanted to create a comprehensive system of public education, unified as a social system, atop of which stood the university. The university, as the head of the Berlin Statistical Bureau, declared in 1836, I mean, just imagine, like you had the hair, the, 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 your, your chief statistician uh, says stuff like this. Uh, so the university goes hand in hand with the infinite progress of our culture, the infinite reform of our society, and freedom itself. This is in 1836. And of course, all the goods from that will trickle down, right? Because that, the system was organized around uh, the trickling down of intellectual, moral, and social goods. Now institutions, of, and this is, I'm stepping back, this is me here. Institutions consist of habitual, organized, and coordinated actions. They depend on stability, fungibility, or substitutability. They require a certain character and conception of agency and intention, which they form through norms, regulations, and the differentiation of roles and status. A healthy institution doesn't simply distribute goods. It shapes good and meaningful lives, ideally. And yet, institutions can become unhealthy. Their rules and their regulations can become recal recalcitrant in the face of new or surprising experiences. I'm sure none of you have ever experienced recalcitrant rules here at BU, at UVA. We've got lots of recalcitrant rules. Like, why do these exist? Why must it be done this way? Makes no sense. And no one has a reason that they can necessarily articulate. That's called alienation. The very people who make an institution can cease to recognize themselves within it. That might be the sign of an unhealthy institution. So the permanent crisis of discipline study in modern universities is this. The institution that made the goods and the values of discipline study and intellectual practices more democratically accessible, more durable, also exposed those same goods to diminishment and those same values to deflection and value capture. 19th century German philology is a good example of this. I probably never thought you'd hear 19th century German philology is a good example of something other than pedantry, maybe that too. But it is a good example of deflection and value capture in the modern research university, not, not only because it was regarded both inside and outside German university, university as the modern scholarly discipline, industrious attention to the most minute of details, devotion to method and ethic of responsibility, exactitude, as well as a commitment and facility to open discussion, and above all, a critical attitude. But also, it was also exemplary because its practitioners were the first to worry about what I've been describing as deflection and value capture. In 1820, for example, less than a decade after his philology seminar had been established at the new University of Berlin, August Böck, one of the 19th century chief kind of uh, philologists, lamented that most philologists pursued the problems of philology through their own highly speci specialized work with a thoughtlessness, an unreflectiveness about the relationship between philology as a specialized form of knowledge, and life. 
the, that rendered both that work and their own, li own lives routine and mechanical. That is, he worried about his students, the students he was training, but also about his colleagues. Like, why the hell are they studying philology? This bears no relationship to why they started studying it. Ten years, less than ten years after, he started what was essentially one of the first graduate kind of seminars at the University of Berlin. So on the one hand, disciplinary specialization and its institutionalization afforded philo uh, philologists like Brook and those in his seminar a certain institutional and social autonomy, enabling them to rationalize their practice and articulate its goods, its values, and just as crucially, its history. You always have to explain what you've always been doing and why you want to keep doing it as a collective. This ensured that only philologists could judge, but it also does this. It also ensures that only philologists could judge philologists. Only philologists could police boundaries that they largely established, determine what counted as philological knowledge, judge who ought to be recognized as a philologist, run their own seminars, control access through their own labor market. One could become a professional philologist without the encumbrances of traditional patrimony and prestige. Just patrimony and, patrimony and patronage of a different sort. On the other hand, philologists had achieved this autonomy by coupling their practice to the modern research university and thus a state-based bureaucratic system of knowledge. And within this system, the study of ancient languages and literatures was worth valuing, not because it formed a more humane person or gave one access to ethical and intellectual resources for creating new values, what people, when they invoke the humanities, uh, sometimes make mistakes and say things like that, uh, but rather because it formed the disciplinary self. The value of a philology derived from its function within the university's division of intellectual labor, within the arts and sciences. So philologists, suggested book, might have gained their autonomy, but at an existential cost. The same institution that afforded unprecedented material conditions, a salary, a pension in the case of German, of Prussian professors for the first time, and infrastructures for philological practice, the university paid for the books gave them offices. It also created the existential conditions and social norms that could diminish all that. In 1873, another philologist, not from Berlin, but this time from Basel, turned Burke's worry into a judgment through the voice of a cantankerous old philosopher bemoaning the demise of both philology and philosophy as resources for living, as he put it. Friedrich Nietzsche wrote in The Future of Our Educational Institutions, and I'm quoting from Nietzsche here, gradually, a profound exploration of the same internal problems has come to be replaced by a historical, in fact, a philological pondering and questioning. What did this or that philosopher think or not think? And is this or that text rightly ascribed to him or not? And even, is this or that reading of a classical text preferable to another? What Nietzsche considered philology's difficult but essential problem, creating meaningful forms of life in the present with the help of ancient ethical resources, had been replaced by difficult but very different sorts of questions and problems. Those of method and disciplinary judgment. For Nietzsche, deflection and value capture were individual and existential phenomena, felt experiences, as well as social phenomena. He was less concerned with the ontological grounds or metaphysical reality of the goods of philology and more with their social reality. I understand his question as something like this. Is the socially constituted practice of philology experienced or narrated as meaningful in itself, or merely as something useful, a means to some external end? Put more plainly, is the doing of some thing experienced as in itself meaningful, or simply as a means to some external end? The pursuit of money, the pursuit of fame, the pursuit of something outside it. If it's only the latter, something that you do, be it baseball, be it philology, be it uh, whatever activity uh, you do, if you experience simply the doing of it as a means to some outside end, for Nietzsche, that's a form of alienation. And yet, the irony of Nietzsche's critique of specialized university-based philology and the research university was that he judged both wanting according to criteria that were and will, that I would say, remain unthinkable without those very institutions. That is, he judged them according to criteria that wouldn't be around without the rise of the state-based research university in its system of higher education. And that he titled his most biting account of all of this, 
in, uh, posthumously pub published Wir Philologen, so we philologist, was not incidental. So it's a biting critique of philologists that he calls we philologist. The problem with, in a, in a way then, with Prussian philologists in universities was perhaps that they did not take their own ideals and values seriously enough. So while Nietzsche was decrying the what he called the paradox of modern academic man from Basel, high-level bureaucrats from the Ministry of Religious and Spiritual Affairs in Berlin were touting, and they oversaw all the entire educational system and all uh, um, Protestant confessing churches, which is what you had in Prussia, um, were touting statistics about Prussian universities that showed booming enrollments. So this is in the mid to late 70s. The data revealed the collective drang, the streben, so the drive, the compulsion of the highest to the lowest classes, as they put it, of a nation for intellectual and moral progress. This is what booming enrollments, they claimed, demonstrated. Beginning as early as 1800, the minister the Ministry uh, of Religious and Spiritual Affairs acquired every province in Prussia to submit a statistical table listing the number of students enrolled and the number of faculty. This practice was gradually codified over the following decades until 1886, when the minister decided to expand its data collection and, with the help of the Royal Statistical Bureau, sought data on what he called the personal Verhältnisse of university students, so like the personal relationships. Of, he wanted to know, get more personal data about students. All right, brief show and tell as I head towards the conclusion. So the Statistical Bureau devised this, which actually is based on one of the uh, a Berlin census. The Statistical Bureau devised a questionnaire to be filled out by every, each student at a Prussian university. The data would be aggregated to make enrollment trends, characteristic of students, et cetera, more what they called anschaulich, so intuitive or visible and even reveal geistige or intellectual patterns. So there are all kinds of questions. You've got like uh, your, 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 last, your last name, where you were born, where your parents lived, um, you know, how did you get here, did you, uh, did you study at the gymnasium? But I want to talk about question 11. This two-part question, Beruf und Berufstellung des Vaters genau anzugeben. That means the, the, the job of your father to be given precisely. Part B, hat der Vater eine Universität besucht? Did, did, your, uh, did your father attend university? These were the two, these are question 11. The response to this two-part question became one of Germany's most salient social categories. The distinction between those men mit and ohne, so with or without akademische Bildung, that is, those with and without a university education, was used to organize an entire population and became a standard feature of government statistics, but also the broader discourse. So what did this category, with or without, mit oder ohne akademische Bildung, uh, with or without university uh, education actually describe? So in a way, university education was both a process, something you did, but it was also a possession, mit oder ohne, the preposition, it's something you have or don't have. And as statistical categories, I think this is cool because I'm in a theology, Cool as in it's allowable, even if you don't even understand it, I feel we can conjure the forces of, uh, of ancient Greek. So if statistical categories could, like Greek verbs, have an aspect, the aspect of with or without a university education, did your father study university, would be perfective or perfect. That is, meaning looking at the action as a whole from an exterior point of view as something that has already been completed, right? So th th does that make sense? Is it's not, tell us about your, your dad's educational experience. Is it something that has already been done? Is it something that can be demonstrated as accomplished, no further questions or interest asked, right? Because education, did you or did you not have a university education, was an indelible characteristic or as Max Weber would put it a couple of decades later, a Bildungspatent. A patent is something that, that, that's inscribed, that's an impressed. You wear it around like a badge. And again, little to no reference to the internal goods of education or discipline study, because that's not actually what matters. In its 1890 report on Prussian universities, the Statistical Bureau reviewed the most recent and historical data and concluded, this was their conclusion based on Decades of data and the most recent data in 1890, which now we've got three years of this sort of data. 
as they put it, the century-long effort to inculcate the, into the German, to inculcate the German population, regardless of class, into a shared belief in the university has succeeded. End quote. The growth of the university in numbers, so enrollment numbers, its status, its power, had established the singular path, what was called the Laufbahn, right? the path of your life, to a meaningful and successful life. First through the gymnasium, right? so the elite second, it's like a lycée in, in, in France. Uh, you had to have um, you had to have an abitur, you had to have the certificate from this elite secondary institution in order to go to university. So you started, that was where you started. If you got that, next step, university. Next step, all the, the series of professional exams. And then finally, just imagine it, if this were your aspiration, into an office in the civil service or state administration. That was a meaningful life. And it also created a new persona, der Studierte as the Bureau put it, the one who has studied at a university. Right? It was a social identity. And yet, the Bureau, it always couldn't help itself, uh, acknowledge that some students remained invisible not only to its statistical method, methods, but also the university. The university just didn't know about them. What, for example, was to be made of all those youth who were uninterested in pursuing Brotstudien, that is, all those youth who came to university wouldn't declare a major, wouldn't uh, engage in Brotstudien, that is, um, uh, professional studies to get a job, who just showed up at university simply seeking, quote, to continue their own education about these students, their intellectual desires, what the hell they were up to, both the Bureau and the universities had little to say. Both had become more concerned about what could be, both the university and the Bureau, what could be externally represented, that is, enrollment statistics, the types of jobs, the fathers, the patrimonial lineages, et cetera. Accounting for the internal goods of education, what people actually did and why they actually did it, maybe. And discipline study was more difficult and less immediately valuable. So the legacy of all these institutions that I've been talking about, both then and now, are the stuff of legends. Academic freedom, like when people invoke the German university, academic freedom, disciplinarity, research, and all the institutional, many of the institutional norms under pinning what are too often, uh, what are often taken for granted as just the natural features of the university. And yet, I'd argue that today for us here and now, the most significant inheritance of these 19th century institutions is the idea of the university as a social process, of the Laufbahn, the life path, what you have to do from secondary school to the university to exams to your first civil service job, the studierte, like the one who has studied, the Bildungspatent, the indelible impression that you wear around you as a marker, not just of what you have done, but of who you are and your social worth. The university in this sense is a social force on par with democratization and industrialization in its revolutionary capacity to reorder societies. I think today, and I'll conclude here, we call all this college, the BA, meritocracy, success, the only path to a meaningful life. And what these things have to do with the internal goods of disciplined study, the values of just doing a thing, I'm not so sure. So, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Wellman, for a fascinating lecture. We have plenty of time for questions, and be sure to speak into the mic when you ask them so the camera can pick them up. Feel free if I said silliness or just multisyllabic words that just kind of collapse into each other or German words to just say I had no idea what you were talking about. I think those are the best sorts of questions because there's a high likelihood that I also don't know and would relish the opportunity to try to explain not only to you but to myself. Seriously, please. Um. Hi, uh, thank you. That was super interesting. Also, um, for what it's worth, I was once that 18-year-old in Western North Carolina. Who no way. Where there. are you from? Uh, uh, Bakersville, if you know where ba that is. Bakersville. I went to App State. In ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, 
in the Nietzsche class uh, uh, discarding my evangelicalism. Um, well, I didn't say discard. <laughs> I said uh, I found it wanting. Yeah, no. Yes, it was That's very wanting. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could speak to maybe, I, I think, I, I didn't hear you very well throughout this, so I apologize if I'm okay. misconstruing something <clears throat> that you said, um, but the, the thing I'm picking up right is that the university creates this systemized sort of um, bureaucratic take, take on the intellectual life or on this creative uh, intellectual process that should be an end itself, but that becomes a goal to some other type of end. And I wondered uh, perhaps if that's sort of maybe one thing that you sacrifice in increasing the accessibility of yeah. those goods, um, that it runs the risk of becoming that, if, if, you, if that makes sense. No, it makes total sense. And I, I mean, I think that's my question, right? I mean, in, in, in a certain way. Um, uh, one are what I've called deflection and value capture. Are they necessary effects? of the bureaucratization um, because like not just three cheers I don't know what's the idiom three cheers four cheers five cheers for bureaucracy I love bureaucracy um, because uh, bureaucracy for example allows people like me for, uh, from, from Western North Carolina no parents no college education um, to have a shot in a way that prior forms of patronage system uh, we're, we're less likely to because one thing I did not talk about um, was not just correlation, uh, but the super high correlation in these surveys between, I mean, you can guess, uh, what, what, did, what did you think the percentage of students who said, yes, my father had studied at a university and they were in their first year at university was in 1870s in Prussia? It was pretty big. Right? They called it so much so that the Statistical Bureau called it uh, a, a familiar Angelegenheit. That is, a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a family thing, studying at the university. It was, it was something that was passed on. The bureaucratization expanded that and, and I think it allowed that. And so I want to identify and kind of celebrate all of those things. But then, and this is my, this is my conceptual question, is are the other features of particular bureaucratic forms, do they necessitate these other things that are less salutary? Are there ways, and I think there are, and this is what my book tries to do, to point out uh, historical examples and current contemporary examples and possibilities going forward. Are there other ways to construct big complex institutions that don't necessarily lead to the forms of diminishments that I, I've identified? Um, so that, yeah, that's my, that's my question and I don't have like a, a pat answer for that because that's what this project is trying to do, not simply to wistfully, you know, dismiss these institutions. But one thing I will say um, is what I also want to do are to identify all the other kinds of institutions, all the other places that what I call the goods of disciplined study are alive and well. Right? Because another effect of this model, this system, and especially as it's adapted and adopted over the course of the 20th century in the US, I would argue, is that the university comes to monopolize those intellectual goods such that it seems that that's the only place that they're valued and can be cultivated, um, which, is, which is not, I think, both as an empirical matter but also as a normative matter is just, just not the case. So that's a broad response, but I don't know if that gets at I just want to, did I hear that correctly, or your question? Yeah, no, that, that clarifies a lot. Um, yeah. That's really helpful. Yeah. Other, other questions? Um, yeah, I'm, I was curious if you see, I don't know if you've, if you were looking exclusively at the United States, really, or uh, globally, but if you see like a market difference in this development, I know you're looking at Germany here, but um, if you see a market difference in this development in countries with weaker socioeconomic safety nets versus stronger socioeconomic safety nets. 
Um, especially as in as it regards the humanities versus like STEM and stuff like. Meaning, that. Uh, the, the way these institutions develop. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. I mean, there's one. Um, uh, I'll give I'll give one example about which um, I'm only now learning and kind of writing about. Um, and that's kind of the post-colonial moment in the 1960s and early 1970s in uh, Tanzania, for, for example, where you had arguments for what we would call kind of robust, very technical, maybe STEMI kind of education, but I think in very different ways from um, kind of socialist, self-identified socialist revolutionaries, right? No, what, what, what this, uh, coming, this nation in Nuche needs is very practical forms of education as opposed to, and I think this is crucial, um, as opposed to the colonial regimes that are based on like A-levels uh, from Britain, right? So and I think that can't be overlooked, and, which is a very different set of conflicts than the 19th century ones I'm identifying. Um, because here, what is the juxtaposition, the conflicts, the contradictions, that seem to be articulated, it's not um, the purity of science, the purity of Wissenschaft or philology versus the utility of the lower trade schools. It's uh, the knowledge that we need to constitute ourselves as a public and a people over against a colonial uh, regime that has a marked interest in keeping basically a shadow regime of British A-levels in place um, and there, I think, the, the kinds of knowledge that the British colonial powers identified, oh, that's merely instrumental and technical, um, I, would, I would be like, nah, I mean, it sounds like Renaissance arguments for <laughs> techne, which is right, like, because knowledge is a, is a form of skill with which and through which we form uh, not just the soil and the earth where we find ourselves, but also ourselves and our brothers and sisters. So I think that's one example uh, that kind of undoes the, the particular Prussian ju uh, juxtapositions. I think you also find it in like the Morrill Act. Uh, does anybody know the Morrill Act? 1862 established all the land-grant universities uh, in the U.S., the a and right, the ag schools, but also Cornell. But also Harvard was one of the biggest recipients of it because it established technical and scientific schools. So that, that bill which, uh, which, which passed Congress 1862, signed by Lincoln during the middle of the Civil War, um, gave lands that states, uh, federal lands, states could sell them off and take the proceeds if they used them to establish a new university or college or to expand already existing ones. Under and the last condition was they had to establish uh, to advance the agricultural, scientific, and technical knowledge, uh, sciences and liberal knowledge like the, 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 the open-ended forms of knowledge. So I think that's another example where you have, on the first level, very similar kind of conflicts and contradictions, but then, but to different purposes and in which you have something really fascinating, which you have scientific knowledge, agricultural science, as a, as a, as a liberal art, as it were, where you can practice engineering because that can also be understood as a, as a craft that has its own internal goods and values. So I think all of these, I think all these different examples, is that kind of, so I think the, this is like the historian in me, or maybe the Hegelian in me, which you have these universal tensions, but the particularities of them are much more fascinating, and, and you don't get, you know, for me, like, settled down in a Prussian framing of them. So I don't know if that addressed, it might have been too oblique. <laughs> Thank you very much for that last answer. And I'd actually love for you to be able to talk mm -hmm. a little more about um, globalization versus nationalism. Yeah. Because on that first slide you had the chart on the left that started in oh, yeah. 1948 and made me think of the Cold War and ah. what that did to um, humanities degrees in the US Mm -hmm. The content of those, potentially uh, languages, you know, m possibly useful for area studies and other, mm -hmm. uh, other functions, but history, English, directed towards 
establishing and deepening a sense of sort of national belonging, philosophy, um, possibly sort of pan-Western. And then after the fall of the Berlin Wall, what happens then? Like what kind of world are we in now and how does that connect, I guess, to the content of the humanities sometimes as building up, you know, sort of national building. Yeah. Yeah, I always thought that was a bullshit project. Like it didn't, it didn't actually exist, like to be, just to be, to be frank. Because, like, I'm going to be the data, the data scientist for a second. Like, look at the high point yeah. of humanities majors. It's not 1989. Uh, it's not immediately post-Cold War. It's right, it's right around, like, 1970. I think 1971, 72 is the high point uh, in terms of ratios, not in terms of absolute numbers, but in terms of the ratio of humanities taken as an aggregate of humanities BAs offered annually as an aggregate um, relative to all other BAs offered. And so that doesn't necessarily, I mean, I think there are, fat, there are lots of, as you alluded to, there are lots of fascinating things to say, I think, uh, and talk about and learn about. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Cold War and the humanities, CAA-funded uh, area studies programs, et cetera, et cetera. But to me, just like looking at this, right, and kind of pivoting off your question, like what happened in 1970, 1971? I'll give you one example. Uh, in, in California, what happened was the radical expansion of community colleges, of state colleges and teaching colleges to include uh, women uh, and students uh, of color in unprecedented ways. It was also the introduction for the first time for student fees. Right? And it was also, and this was largely people, I think there's, there's an entire history, of course, of like Clark, Clark Kerr, president of the University of California system, um, basically being pushed out when Reagan is elected governor. Um, I'm not going to defend Reagan. But I'm not also going to defend Clark Kerr because Clark Kerr, his entire argument, and I'm using California as a roundabout way to get to your question, his entire argument for the California plan, which made uh, establish the, the California system of higher education, was organized, and this was already as kind of a centrist liberal around 1960, 61, was organized a highly stratified system of education. He fought tooth and nail to limit the number of UCs, like UC Berkeley, UC Irvine, he helped build, you know, establish UC Irvine, as the only ones who were authorized to grant PhDs, and also just even more fascinating, the only ones who could legitimately claim to teach the full extent of, quote, the liberal arts. The rest of them, so you had the state university, the state colleges and state uh, schools, they were technical and professional schools. And then you had community colleges, which were gateways. And so, and this is when this begins to, the, the pressure becomes so much that it begins uh, uh, to, to, to break. And so schools um, begin offering um, what Kerr claims that these other students who can't get, go to a UC, what they actually want and deserve, which are technical educations. And so that's, uh, when they become, when these students who Kerr has identified as the lower strata of California socioeconomic, uh, when they start to come online in the system, that's when you see uh, degrees in nursing and physical education and business start to overwhelm the proportion of, quote, the humanities. To me, that's, I would see that 1970 date. That's a strong interpretive claim. <laughs> uh, but like that, that, that's how I would frame it like that. And then I would come back to around the question of you know, how to constitute like a national uh, canon or something like that, because I think that's a, it's a related but um, a, a, a different set of, of, of issues. Does that, does that skirt or? Just to press it on that last thing, so value capture, I do that. Pardon? Is it va value, sorry, value capture. Yeah, uh-huh. What's the antecedent to national values? I don't know. What, like, what would that so, name? As opposed to sort of global financial or vocational technical things, uh. things that you can move around oh, oh, to a place. Whereas if you study English, 
Oh, I see. In France, or anywhere that's colonized by France, necessarily. Oh. Or if you if you come oh, from, if you come from studying languages, uh, history, yeah. uh, literature in China, mm -hmm. are you going to come here and study English, and then you're going to go back to China and teach English literature there, or are you going to? Wait. So what 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 do I think? So I'm just thinking about value capture. Like, uh -huh. Is it? Your last point, uh -huh. technical vocational degrees oh. as a sort of chip or token. You can use ah, it. I, see. I see, I see, I see. No, I, I would argue, I, I see, as a, as, a, as a conceptual matter, I, like, I would argue, no, I don't think, it can be, but I think we can, we can in a sense, vocationalize uh, a philosophy degree just as well as we can vocationalize an engineering degree um, in, in, in the sense that, to me, a liberality of education, or at least the kinds of education that I want to fight for, yeah. um, it names more, it names less discrete subject matters, masterable skills, uh, for example, and it names more a disposition or relationship one has with um, the doing of learning and the doing of, 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 of knowledge making. So for example, my 18-year-old son, he is a freshman in a hardcore engineering school, um, and, and it, it took him uh, it, four years of his high school to, I think, disabuse me of this false conception of what engineering was. Uh, not to mention, you can imagine the, uh, the father-son uh, Oedipal turmoils that, 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 that involved as well. Um, for him, basically, I think, to show his dad, Mr. Liberal Arts, that what he did, mechanical engineering, which he always understood. I, mean, he, I, I was, I spent his entire, you know, middle school and high school so depressed because he didn't read, he didn't like to read. And like I did, I've done two things in my life, play baseball and read. Like that's it. Like that's all I like to do. And he didn't like sports, he didn't like to read. I was like, what the hell do you do with your life? Like, and so I, it, and, but what he taught me, and this is very kind of anecdotal, right? <laughs> humanity shattered is an anecdote. Uh, what, he, what he taught me is that, no, you can, relation, you can relate to, for him, um, the making of components for, um, he, li he liked to build uh, basically uh, things that fly of all sorts. You can relate to the crafting of that in ways that aren't simply instrumental, that aren't simp in, in the ways that he would build things, he wouldn't sell them, he, he, would, he would test fly them, wouldn't even go out and do them again, wouldn't let me do it, and just let them sit there in the basement. And he's like, oh, well, I just wanted to see if I could do it. I really liked it. He, he, wouldn't, do, he wouldn't do his calculus homework, you know, he, he would do, but that's what he would do. So, I, so my circuitous response is, I hope that the value capture concept, what I want it to do, is to get at that type of relationship. And so my question about kind of the bureaucracies and institutions, how do we have to craft our institutions and our bureaucracies, our lives together, such that when life intervenes, we can still attend to the good that is in the doing of my son uh, building a bearing. Uh, for the landing mechanism for his plane. But I can also at the same time, he also has no, he sent me, he already interviewed for his like job fair as a freshman. It was, it was a complete in defense industrial complex interview schedule. Like he's like, but Papa, the only place I get to really do that, what I like to do excellently and with all the resources that I can imagine is at a place like Raytheon. I was like, but you know what else they make? He's like, well, that, yeah. You know, so I think, it, it, uh, you know, we live in the seculum, and this is where we find ourselves. And so I think internal, I just, I want to I wanna make an argument that, okay, external goods, they're always going to be there. Nobody's got to worry about those. But the internal goods, let's, uh, let's, let's fight for those and lift them up where we can. So I just kept going in circles. Did that at all get at what? Because I think I misunderstood your question initially. Yeah. It is hope. See, that's why I got hope. My, my son.
Because I think I know I have a lot of friends who practice philosophy and literature doing in, in more instrumental ways than my son would ever conceive of practicing engineering. And I love them, but yeah. Okay, I just want to apologize if this question, <laughs> I have to like workshop it as I get through it. Um, but, so you called the university kind of like, uh, I think you said the words life path, and I feel like that's kind of similar to how I view like being a freshman in college, and then it's kind of why like over the past week I've been doubting like my major, and then going through I think like- How long have you been here? To, like literally since August? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like a typical process, but I was wondering if you have any, I guess I'd say advice for how to go about attending college when you want to set yourself up for the rest of your life, and then specifically being a humanities major, because I just feel like, I mean, I mean, I feel like for like the STEM majors, it might be a little bit easier to define. And then when you have, when you're a humanities major with like goals that have a bit more, they're like, have longevity, but they don't really have like a direct like next step. I don't, I don't know if that question makes sense, but. No, I never, I never heard those concerns. Uh, <laughs> No, I, I, to me, I, mean, I just want to say first, like, I think you're, you're, you're asking, like, that you can ask this question in the fall of your first year. I mean, like, job well done, whoever teaches here. You know, that, like, that you're in that position to even conceive, however workshoppy it wasn't. Your question is, like, that's a real success, I want to, I want to say. And, and... I mean, you and everybody, who else? Is anybody else in their first year here? I mean, this is just, this is the final step you've been training for since like kindergarten. Like in Germany, in 19th century Prussia, it started in the gymnasium, you know, just like your secondary school. Here, college starts when you're in kindergarten, I mean, basically, or maybe even preschool. And, and it's kind of over when you step foot on campus. Like, you are already are de studierte. The aspect of your life has been completed. I mean, you had to die really hard to flunk out at an elite school in the U.S. <laughs> like you had to work really hard. In part because it's it's a really onerous process as a professor <laughs> to give somebody an F. Uh, just a, a little secret. Sorry, uh, <laughs> it's more paperwork than it's worth. Um, and. So one thing to even recognize that you have been on a Laufbahn, as the, the Germans uh, had, had said, this, this, and it's Lauf as in Lauf, like you're running on this track that's, that's determined, that's fixed. You've always known what was next, right? Um, to even envision the possibility of another path or um, another possibility for a meaningful life, I think is, uh, is, 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 is huge. Um, you know, as for the major thing, just, you know, I mean, in what, it, what it primarily is, like, it, it's a bureaucratic structure, right, which good and bad. It, it's a way, at UVA, it's like 10 courses. It doesn't. I mean, because now the Laufbahn, you know, probably for, I would imagine, students like you, is that the, it, it's at least a master's, a PhD, a professional degree. I mean, it will continue in, 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 until you die or give up. Um, so just recognize where you are and, and ask your own, uh, your own questions about that. And my concern is trying to understand, what I want to try to understand is, is, the, pos is, is the possibility of like what, what could we do to these types of institutions? Maybe. Maybe it, it's, it's uh, be attentive to where you can find these goods that aren't simply in the university, because uh, it might be, you know, a secondary place to, to find this. It's not an answer that you want, but just keep doing whatever it is that, that you have done to ask those questions, and I think um, that's to be, at least for me, to be cheered. Yeah. So, is it on? Okay. Um, I had this question like from the beginning of your lecture, but after your question, I'm actually gonna like come at it from a different angle um, because you mentioned just now, and like I totally think you're 100% right, and I think most people in here would that like you're set up for college, like kind of from the moment. I mean, not for everybody, but a lot of people, I think. Um, 
from like kind of the moment you're born, you're put on this sort of track to you go to a good pre-K, so you get into a good elementary school, mm -hmm. elementary school to middle school, middle school to high school, and then high school. Yeah, let me ask a question. Like, just a, this is my favorite. Oh, shit. <laughs> who who remembers the day where you were, the hour of the day that you decided, oh wait, I want to go to college. <laughs> right? It's an absurd question. I do. Because none of, none of my family didn't go to college. It was an actual decision. So I think, like, I think that's the salient. I, I'm, my entire time at UVA, I've been there since 2007, I have met one student who actually, quote, decided to go to college. Oh, that's a thing I want to do. I mean, I, yeah, so, like, it, so the people who are at a BU, at a UVA, it's not a discreet decision. It's not existential. It is, it is a social laufbahn, right? It's a social path. Yeah. Um, so, Sorry, I just like I had to. No. Right? I mean, the, is that I don't know. Is that yeah. does that seem? Yeah, no, that seems like a good question right? to ask people because yeah. I don't personally know anybody who decided to go to college. I know people, including myself, who are like, my parents aren't making me go to college, but <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm yeah. here. Um, I can't go back home if I don't. But yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, but I guess you said in the start of your lecture, like all things will that we create, like, will wilt away or fade away. Um, and we created, like, the college or, like, the university. So if your whole life is set up to go to a university and go to college and get your degree, whatever it may be, like, if it is in STEM or humanities, then what is kind of, like, in your perspective, like, I don't want to say the purpose of life, but, because that's a really big question to ask, but, like, What's the point of going to pre-K? That's What's my the next point of going slide. To... It's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't have a slide for that. What, so I'm sorry. Are you like, got... what's the point of like going to high school? Let's say, like, if you're not doing it, because like even high school, like you're not learning practical things in life. You're not learning how to cook. You're not learning how to change a tire. Like, and even now, have any of you tried? I've been doing my daughter's. My daughter. I have an 11th. So I have a, a freshman in college. I have an 11th grader. <laughs> and an eight-year-old. <laughs> oh, <my laughs> he will be with us forever. Uh, <laughs> so for the past three weeks, we've been doing her AP homework on um, Open AI, Open AI's uh, kind of GPT, GPT3 playground. You know, so the, the new language model, 175 million parameters. Oh my gosh, it is amazing. It was made for um, advanced placement courses. Like she's doing all. I mean, she sends it in as like, hey, you gave us this pr prompt for AP US history. An entire paper, you know, just sort of, you know, like, so what is she learning anything? Uh, you know, th and that is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah, like you're not learning yeah. practical things like life skills really in high school or in middle school. You're learning more how to prepare yourself for college. So if college and university is going to go away, then how is that going to affect like the educational system below? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, all right. So here's the here's the scholarly response to that. I'm trying to understand the history of that. Like my argument, my, I think my, I'm trying to, to, to write a history of how what you just described in a way came into being. And I think this, the Prussian system of higher education um, as a laufbahn, as uh, where you could statistically describe um, the strata of classes in relationship to the state and capital uh, as to where they fit in in this, the university system and then how that developed in, in, in the US. I'm trying to tell the history conceptually and kind of institutionally about that. Um, that's not, in, in the first sense, that's not a normative project, as in as bad or good. Um, but I guess, to put my cards on the table, I mean, as though I haven't already, uh, I think there's a lot that, that's, that's good and also a lot that's really bad about that. One of the bad things I felt I've, <clears throat> Um, I want to say about about that is, um, and this maybe relates to, perp to, to purpose. Um, so for five years until last year, my family and I lived on campus at University of Virginia, like right in the middle of campus. We uh, so I had 300 students in Brown College, kind of UVA's one of three um, residential colleges where students live all four years, we have our own dining hall, it really is like a really tight community. Um, it's for all the non-J crew looking type of UVA kids, like all the, you know, it, 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 I love them. Uh, and it, it, that's not the wrong verb. Uh, and, and what I dealt with on a daily basis 
We're not questions about majors. We're not questions about STEM. We're not. It was mental health crisis after mental health crisis, three to four times a day. And um, in my experience, that was wrapped up with this kindergarten to BA to professional school, school experience, where they finally get there. And so there's like, <laughs> I don't know if you ever had this. You've been stressed about something. You don't really know it, like a big test, a big exam. And like, you're just to the grind for like weeks on end. And after you do it, it's like the body just collapses. Anybody have familiar with that? <laughs> That's what I felt like I was dealing multiple times a day with the students uh, who, who, who were part of Brown College. Um, and so I think my concern with this system uh, existentially came out, of, came out of that. So what that has to do about what is the purpose of high school, what is the purpose of college, I would say what it does for me, it points to a gap or a disjuncture between, on the one hand, um, what we know college socially is, like what it does. I mean, you've all seen the data, right? The correlation between lifetime earnings, between health, between uh, early mortality, between you know, uh, alcoholism, with marriage. I mean, the correlations you know, with BA at, uh, education attainment, as, as the sociologists say, and all of those things are pretty insane, right? I mean, we, that is the, if not the, it's one of the two um, dividing lines in, in U.S. society now. And um, so I wanted to understand that. So that's like social knowledge. And that's, it's at a disjuncture with something I want to, like um, an individual moral commitment like these ideals about what education could be, these aspirations for what a life could be. So on the one hand, we have these individual moral commitments and ideals that are very real and others share as well, but we also have this social knowledge. Like, I gotta go to college, I gotta get a BA, I gotta finish. And they're at a, at a, there's a gap there, both I would say socially, but also the gap, my students, whom I got to know really well, um, like wore it in the course of their life, like breaking down and stuff. This, again, it's it maybe too abstract, but um, I think we have to, re you know, I want to say the purpose of college is social stratification and social order. <laughs> right? That's what it does. Uh, also, social co college might be one of the few places for an elite strata at a few elite institutions um, to take a class called Beyond Good and Evil and like it totally changed your life. You know, to be like the caricature humanities poster boy. Both and. Is that at all? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your lecture. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned how there are some students who go to university just for the sake of going to university and how they well, that, that was what the, that was what the, the Royal Statistical Bureau said in 1890. Oh, okay. And how they strive for like um, the status of going there instead uh. of actually trying to learn something or getting a career in the future. Mm -hmm. So what do you think universities can do to limit those kinds of students coming in or at least to help them change the thinking and um, help them find a purpose in life? Or do you think it would be worth it to do that? Well, I, uh, universities like UVA, with an endowment of $16 billion, has zero interest in, in mitigating and in, in doing anything structurally about that. Um, everything, how they understand, how UVA, for example, understands itself as an institution works against those, like, I, I would argue, actually asking those types of questions because they might ask those types of questions out of, out of their existence, right? Uh, like a lot of things they don't, they do, we do, don't really jibe with kind of a sincere um, way of asking those types of questions. Um, so I think that's one thing I would, I would say, like recognize how, you know, our system of education functions. Um, and, uh, and why it does the things that, 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 it, that it does. 
And yet, despite all that, they're glorious goods that can only be found, in, at least in the U.S., in colleges and, and universities. Like weird things. Like places like studying German. <laughs> uh, studying German philosophy. Um, it's, it's quite, had I gone on, you know, the, the other paths available to me, like the Marine, the Marine Corps, I probably would not have read Nietzsche and probably would not have gotten a PhD in German philosophy. Uh, right? Uh, and, and so, um, I guess I, it's, it seems like a lot of people have, it's, it's, they find it difficult to, to hold those two things at once. To me, that's just life, like <laughs> the contradictions of life. Um, but one thing I would, I would want to say is um, I used to use the language of reform and recovery. I think, you know, like we need to reform the university, we need to recover. But I think that's silliness. I, I think it's, a, it's, bad, it's bad history. Um, and I think institutionally it's, it's, it's bad. And like I make it, I'll stop here. Um, in the, the book I'm working on now, I, the way I conceptualize this is that I make a distinction between the university and the academy. Um, and it's like a historical quirk that those two coincided for as long as they did, maybe sometimes. But the academy is alive and well in all kinds of places. And, and so find it where you can is, 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 and we collectively find it, sustain it, and defend it where we can. And if it continues to be in places that we call universities, then, then that's great. Um, but it's also alive and well in other places. And to reduce it to the university is a, I think is a big, is a big mistake. Uh, among other things, it, it, um, it obscures kind of the, like the dappled universe of, of knowledge and the kinds of things that people who've never stepped foot in the university know and can share and can teach us uh, as well. So. Again, not a, not, a, not a pithy kind of answer, but I think it's not in the universe, it's not a UVA's interest to do a lot of things. Um, and so it's illuminating to try to understand the reasons, institutionally speaking, they do the things that, that they do. And they oftentimes have different ends than um, we might presume. Or at least I've been surprised again and again. <laughs> I should stop being surprised. But. So I'll, I'm going to ask two questions, but the second one depends on, on the first. So to go back a little bit to the talk, on the one hand, you're, you're explaining that the Prussian university, at least from the superstructural or bureaucratic standpoint, isn't so much concerned about internal goods and, and instead is concerned about this formation. And I wondered if you could fill out, there has to be some substance to whatever that yeah. formation is that they're valuing. So could you say a little bit about what it was in particular, what set of values or traits or whatever it is that they were seeing the university as producing? What, was, what is the substance to that particular formation? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I mean to say it kind of uh, bluntly, bluntly, I think in, the, in the, first, the first three or four decades, it was a philosophical anthropology and a philosophical history um, that was trying to rest for, uh, and constitute, for lack of a better term, like uh, a secular confessionalism, like in, along Kantian lines, as in we will realize uh, reason here in these Prussian institutions. I mean, you can hear Hegel there. I mean, I, mean, I might not. I might just be speaking to you. I don't know. But I mean, like that was. The, I'm not like that was. I think that when you go back and, and, and read these memoranda and what they wanted to do, um, I mean, the, the language, at least until like the, the 40s, is, uh, is, is shockingly aspirational in these very identifiable kind of idealistic, like Kant, post-Kant idealistic terms. That was the substance uh, of... So uh, absolute, an instantiation uh, of absolute spirit. Making, making reason real was the project. I'm not even, yeah. Uh, and I, that, I, I, I would argue that. 
and then stuff goes south, you know, <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the turn of the century, and lots of uh, competing visions, not the least of which is the rise of the natural sciences um, in the second half of the 20th century. And there you have a real competition for what constitutes um, epistemic authority and legitimate knowledge. And ultimately, that kind of triumphs. And I don't think it was a necessary relationship, but the affordances of natural sciences in terms of a much easier relationship with capital and the growth of industry, industry in Germany, especially the, like the chemical industry, um, cannot be un, under, underestimated for how it kind of transformed that more aspirational philosophical project. But at the beginning, it was really like, we need to constitute a public, we have a, we have a monarchy, um, we have to understand what does the university do? It realizes reason here on earth, the, 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 the ends. And, um, and uh, that, like, I, 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 I kind of believe the, like the, the von Altenstein, the Humboldt, when they, when they write these things, they weren't, they'd all been trained, you know, kind of in the, kind of the Kantian idealism, but that was the substantive project. But the substantive project is kind of transformed again around the turn of the century, and I think it's a real kind of competition with the rise of the natural sciences. And, as the Prussian state expands, as industry expands, the relationships were, um, were much tighter or more obvious, or just they were more uh, portable. You know, in the language I was talking about with the value capture, you know, you could, you could have all kinds of uh, accounts of what we're doing by saying this, this had this uh, monetary uh, effect. Is that so, yeah? So, so the second question then relates to that. And so, if we if we have in mind the idea of internal goods, the idea of a practice like literature or fly tying or knitting, and coming by participation in them to love and see and realize them and to grow into excellence into them. Okay, and and then if we imagine maybe the university as a place where that's happening ideally in discrete ways, say in the philosophy department, they're loving wisdom. And in the literature department, they're loving the goods that are unique to engaging with literature and so on. Um, if we get to that place, I guess there's still this open question of, it's one thing to be a good philosopher, because you could be a good philosopher and still be a Nazi, right? And mm -hmm. like Heidegger. And it's, it's another thing to be a good human being. And, it, and I'm wondering, based on both your historical work, but then your practical work at, at UVA, should the university be in the business of trying to affect that latter type of formation? That is something beyond, um, as it were, seducing people into the internal goods and their excellent practice and their full enjoyment, and instead trying to make someone not just a, a good scholar, but a good human being, or is that like a fundamentally misguided thing that is asking too much of the university? Um, a, a twofold response to that. Um, one, I would say historically, the wages of that attempt to, to, to bind those together, right? To, to form excellent practitioners, to make people good philosophers, good literature scholars, good engineers, good pathologists, good physiologists, to bind that, to couple that so tightly with a vision of uh, a morally good person and a morally good member of a community. Um, the wages of that attempt are pretty disastrous. Uh, not even with like the proleptic anticipation that everything ends in Hitler studies and you know <laughs> uh, that that you know I, I think you can even you I would argue that just in terms of the 19th century. Um, so that's to say that my three cheers, five cheers, whatever for internal goods of discipline study are just that. Like I I, I feel that's how endangered I feel uh, they they are in kind of the contemporary institutional settings and conditions such that um, I have all kinds of thoughts, you know, and arguments about 
broader moral ends and our inability um, in the, in the, you know, to, to, to bring these two notions of ends uh, together. Um, and it, in, in the German context, it, it, it is really wrapped up with, okay, now that we've um, part, you know, now that we've parted ways with this ideal of the university of knowledge, the unity of knowledge, what do we do? We, now we just have a division of labor, but there's no division of labor without an idea of the whole. And um, that becomes like the question that ultimately kind of sinks uh, well before the rise of the Nazis in the 1920s. Um, already around 1900, that fiction, to quote Weber, has already collapsed. Um, and I think the <clears throat> you know, contemporary universities um, we, the thing is, we do have an operative moral vision that, that, that I would argue that suffuses it and is a certain form of economic rationality. The only shared moral reasons that we have are those of economic utility. Like that's a moral vision. And um, so my five cheers for internal goods and be excellent at the practice that you pursue um, is five cheers against economic rationality, which is the only reasons that you have to give your life any meaning or economic ones is wrong, is false, is evil, and it will destroy your life. You know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, does that... You know, um, thank you for your lecture um, and for answering these questions. Uh, my question might be uh, related to that and maybe also the question about socioeconomics um, but as like truth and purpose and what happened and what should happen become more like polar in my opinion or more mm -hmm. political um, is there is the is the health of humanities and maybe also the popularity of it or um, is it is it related to or does it correspond to the political health of a nation. I guess I said yeah. I'm also from the Carolinas, and I, I South Carolina, North Carolina. Yeah, South Carolina. Where, where in South Carolina? Uh, Charleston. Charleston. Yeah. And I didn't apply to any schools in the South because I knew I was going to be going into the humanities, and I was scared of what kind of filter or what kind of perspective I was going to have to sift through um, in terms of what happened specifically. But um, is the, is there a way to depoliticize the humanities, or is, is its health? Uh, intrinsically connected to the political health of the nation? Or is this question and too That's a great question. Big? Yeah. Um, what did I see? Um, I think what I would want to say, uh, you know, you know, on the one hand, to quote, to quote Aristotle, or to paraphrase Aristotle, uh, that we are social beings, we are political beings, and we should take that very seriously. Um, Values are everywhere. They're dripping from everything we touch, we desire, we share, we aspire to. And I find that a beautiful and glorious thing. It's also a painful, conflict-inducing, strife-inducing thing. And to imagine Instead of using depoliticized, I'll say to imagine a valueless world is to imagine a world without color, is to imagine a, where, a world without desire, is to imagine a world without care. It's like trying to play baseball without wanting to win. <laughs> Maybe a, my, my wife would say that was a horrible analogy. Uh, but that's how it goes. Um, and so what I, you know, um, But the, va the values that I think we can affirm, that I, that I want to seek to affirm, are that there is something valuable, and that's going to be contested simply in the excellent practice of something, if it's baseball, if it's in mechanical engineering, if it's learning to read German philosophy. And that, to actually take those values seriously, you know, uh, is going to put you in conflict with all kinds of people. So 
to, to say that the politicization of the humanities or the university is like, I mean, it, 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 it's existed in the world and it has always been. It's just that though that politicization has been codified and monopolized either by um, a particular church, uh, a particular state, um, and a particular regime, regime, and now the fissures are <laughs> much more visible. And, uh, and so the, the endangered values, to my mind, are, are the ones where how, how you can recognize that, but also then against all those odds, hold up, not to the exclusion of other values, but the values that are internal to those practices. And also recognize that like actual education isn't simply about adjudicating through debate. Like, like I never hold classroom debates, you know, just to, to be a more practical about it. Like that's silliness, that's not education. Um, that's, that's performance, that's a high school competition, I would say. Um, so that's, I kind of step back from that. But what I want to say is like, embrace the fact that if there are values that are in conflict, you know, it's not going to be easy, but it's an acknowledgement, I would say, of like the seculum where we find ourselves. Okay, final question. Um, as I was listening to this, I was, I was um, envisioning Charlie Chaplin just getting sucked into the gears of his um, machine, and but um, so that. But with a smile. Yeah. <laughs> with, with a sense of gratitude, yeah. like, well, I find myself in this machine. Yeah. Um, so and then he gets crushed. But yeah. A lot of yeah. Um, a lot of scholars are talking more and more about the roles of imagination um, and the poisoning of our imagination as we are being, as it's being, our imagination is being taken from us and something else placed in its stead as it relates to um, the future, basically. And maybe, I don't, I, I'm just like thinking about this, but who are these poisoners of which you speak? It, well, it seems that, that from, from, from preschool, a future oh. is, is, is given to us, as we've, oh. as we've said. Um, and that, well, since we're, since we're invoking Weber, um, does, does the proclivity of um, capitalism to envision future, um, to speed up, to as Charles Winslow Taylor has like exemplifies in scientific management, does that play into or exacerbate this process, or does this process predate it? I guess. And can imagination become an alternative or a, a yeah. hopeful practice? I guess. Oh yeah, a hundred, a hundred and ten percent. I think yeah, Ab absolutely. And, and in particular, you know, in this instance, a particular form. Of of, um, of capitalism, kind of a state, a much more state-aligned capitalism. And as I was responding to Professor De Cosimo's question, I mean, this is exactly at the time uh, when the the, the German uh, chemical industry is 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 taking off, in very close alliances with the development of the natural sciences, the real funding of the German research university in alliance uh, with with, for example, the chemistry industry. And so that to me, that's the subtext of all of this. Another you could, you could throw out, I think, so uh, Nietzsche got his PhD um, from the University of Leipzig in uh, like 68, 67. Just 40 years earlier, um, I think 85% of its budget, University of Leipzig, uh, was um, from its own funds. That could be from the rents it made on the buildings that it owned like in downtown <laughs> Leipzig through uh, it, it was one of the few that had a, a sort of endowment over, over centuries. Um, but by the time Nietzsche graduated, um, a few years, I think the, the, the statistics I have are from 1870, so two or three years after he graduated, that had completely, in, uh, almost completely inversed. Uh, by the time he graduated, um, the state accounted for like 72% of its budget. This is all within a matter of two to four decades, and it's across the board in German universities. 
and the University of Berlin, which is oftentimes celebrated as the first research university established in 1810, um, it was from the get-go an almost 100% state-funded um, operation because it was so new it had no um, endowments, uh, as, as it were. So the story of kind of state capital, state investment um, is inextricable from the one here and relating it and to kind of tie it hopefully maybe together to this question of the capacity to avoid value capture and value deflection, um, there's a tremendous pressure to account for what you're doing as an institution vis-a-vis -vis your funders, vis-a-vis -vis the sources of capital, vis-a-vis uh, -vis external interest, a public in which the state was trying to conjure and make visible, like, why are we funding these universities? You know, there have to be goods that flow to the universities. Um, and in a, I think you could tell the story in a, in, a, in a way, it wasn't like metaphysical, it was uh, the need to give accounts of what's going on internally in a university. Um, it's, people were much more compelled to give accounts of the external goods, like, you know, how does this help, quote, the public? How does this help the state? How does this help the industry? Um, those became, in a way, overwhelming over the course uh, of, of the century. And they're also, quite frankly, I mean, they're more, it's easier to come up with an account that simply provides the growth in enrollments, the growth in Leipzig's tax base over the course of, of 50 years, right? The, the, the trust uh, that are given numbers and, and a certain form of quantification. Um, and you're the one who quoted Weber, uh, the, the conceptual and historical relationship between quantification and capitalism are deeply entwined. And so I think 100%, like that's part of the story um, I tell, but not the only one, but I think it's, it, it's crucial, right? The, the, the people are compelled to give these accounts of external goods on the one hand because they have to, you know, or the state's gonna, you know, yank the funding, the pressure is. Uh, on the other hand, um, it's really hard to describe to, some, to my wife, for example, why baseball is beautiful. She thinks it's the most boring, she hates it, she'll go because my eight-year-old son plays, but she does not get the internal goods of baseball. But she does get the odds of our son who now plans on being a major league baseball player, not only that, but playing for the Angels, right, without going to college. Um, she does get that and how preposterous that is. So I think, it, and, it, and it's not like she's a bad person, but she understands the compelling nature of external goods. So. All right, let's thank Dr. Wilmer. <laughs> and please join us on November 8th for our next lecture from Professor Jennifer Frey.